Lord, we lift up the Lord, name of the Lord all across this place. Lord, we give you glory. We give you honor. We thank you, Jesus, for everything that you've been doing right now, God. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. It's so good to be with all of you this morning. We're so thankful for you joining us. Uh, you may be seated. Um, Sister Sharon is going to come at this time, and she's going to share a missions moment with us. But before we do that, we ought to give God some glory for the She's for Christ offering that we took up. Over $9,000. Amen. And so we're so thankful for all of you that give um, and do whatever you can to give. And it's such an awesome thing. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Faulkner. This morning, I'm going to take us to the country of Brazil and um, show you the missionary that we support since 2017. I'm not going to go to a lot of demographics uh, about Brazil, but as you can see, it's the largest country of South America and that it borders almost every country in South America. So it, its um, population is about 209 million and the main uh, language is Portuguese. The next picture will show you um, Ken and Isabel Cooper. Uh, they are the missionaries there, and they have three children. And a little history on them is they're from Cooper City, Florida, and they were the Sunday school directors in that church there for 12 years before they felt the call to missions. And then four years, they, um, they went into the Ames program. And while they were in the Ames program, um, they felt a burden for the children there in Brazil. This next little part I'm going to tell you is, is it actually came out of our Pentecostal Life magazine that we get here at the church. And this will be a little difficult to read, but it's just about a paragraph long. But it'll kind of tell you why they have the burden that they do. And I really wanted to be able to convey that to you. Um, it says, there is an epidemic of utter hopelessness in the poverty-stricken ghettos of Brazil. Families are forced to survive by selling their children into the sex and drug trade as a way to bring finances into their home. As young as age eight, these children begin running drugs. As young as age 11, they are sold into prostitution. Beyond the struggling families, Brazil is home to over 3.7 million orphans, many of them living on the streets. Almost half of these street children will die before their 18th birthday. These children need a place of refuge where they can grow and learn in a safe environment without the fear of harm. So in 2001, according to what I read, and I also emailed Brother Cooper, I wanted to make sure I had their story right. In 2001 is when they felt the burden, and they spent the next many years trying to raise funds to build an orphanage. They bought a piece of property in Brazil, and um, this was in 2012, and so they started their plans and they actually, the next slide will show you kind of from a distance what they have built. And they have like a kitchen, an administrative, uh, administration building, a um, one dorm right now. And they are bringing families in. The next slide will show you three children that, and there have been more of families that they have helped. But right now they're, they're waiting, they're raising the funds for their main orphanage, their main dormitories. I think they're going to have two main dormitories from what I understood. And the next slide will show you when they were in their AIMS program in Brazil, they actually, the, the, the main people that were one to the Lord were children, and they baptized like 400, 4,000 children while they were there in the AIMS program. So they're really, really trying to reach out to the children. Um, the next slide if you're interested in keeping up with them, this is their Facebook page, and it's fairly easy to remember. Cooper's on a mission. And so if you can, just keep those children in your prayers and, and keep the Coopers in your prayers. Hey Amen. Thank you so much. You did a great job. Sister Martin is going to come at this time. She's got an announcement. I actually.
actually have three announcements. The first one is something to do with children as well. Doer UPC, we love our kids and our young people, and we try to invest in them as much as we can. We realize that if we don't invest in them, then this world is certainly going to lure them away because there's a lot out there that is vying for their attention. And so on Tuesday evening at 6.30, we are going to be meeting with our girls ages 7 to 12 for Becoming Me. Um, we have this meeting about once a quarter. And so we're asking the mothers to bring their young girls ages 7 to 12 just for one hour. That's all we ask. And it's a time of um, fun and food and talking and a little bit of instruction. And they just get to feel special for that one hour because um, we're giving them all of our attention. And so we ask that you would bring your girls to becoming me because that's who we want them to become. We want them to become the me that the Lord has uh, created them to be. And this, this time I want to let you know that I had a young mother come to me probably about three months ago or so and, and wanted to do something in the church. And so um, Sister Sarah Brock is going to be hosting during that hour uh, upstairs in the commons area of the upper room, the young people's uh, area. She's going to be hosting just an hour get together for mothers with kids up to the age of 18 or high school. And uh, we're gonna have a little bit of snacks and there's not really a program. She's not gonna preach to you. You're just gonna get together and talk and exchange ideas. And so we would like for all of you to come, moms. Doesn't matter if you have a boy or a girl, we just would like for you to come, ages zero to um, high school. And that would be at 6.30 for one hour as well. And then another announcement that I have is for the Dewar Annual Harvest Festival. Um, it's going to be October 5th over uh, right near the post office across the street at City Hall and that that block is they block that off and they have games and um, food and different booths and this year we are going to have a booth for the church is that correct yes we're going to have a booth for the church um, inviting people having flyers flyers there announcing our uh, trunk or treat that we're going to be having at the end of October and so also last year we were in charge our church volunteered and uh, we were in charge of the games. And so I need about 12 volunteers. If you'd come and see me uh, in the next couple weeks and let me know your name, you can come after church today. Um, it would be from 9 to 2 on October 5th, Saturday. So I need about 12 people, and it can be people from the Youth Alive as well. And then I just, um, this isn't really an announcement, but I personally want to thank everybody that worked at Beautiful You yesterday. This church, for you that don't may not know this, this church hosted, we weren't in charge of it, we, we didn't have anything to do with the planning of this little conference, it wasn't really a little conference, we had about 350 people here yesterday, young girls, and this conference is just for them, um, teenagers, there were, I think they had 50 hyphen girls in that class, um, which is our uh, above high school age and college age girls. Um, we had a team here from our church that helped um, kind of crowd patrol, restroom patrol, um, whatever you want to call it. We were here just to be at their beck and call. John and Sharon Williams, Brother Mike Rohatch, Angela Branson, Deidre, Faye, and Tanya. And Brother Faulkner was on in the media booth, and Sister Faulkner led worship. And uh, I was just so proud to be able to say that this was our people, and I had people come up to me after the church and thank me for all the help that we had available to this conference. And I do want to let you know that three young ladies received the Holy Ghost at the end of the conference. So it was well worth our time. It was well worth the money that the Wagner Church spent and their efforts to get here because three young ladies, their lives were forever changed. And I just wanted to let you know what happened here and what our church was involved in. Thank you, Sister Martin. And I do believe that that financial investment is what, so the three young girls that got the Holy Ghost were from the Wagner Church. Right. 
And so when they invest their time and their treasure and all the things that we're working on this year, you look at what happens. And so um, your, your She's for Christ dollars, your offering dollars, your tithe dollars, everything that you're doing is not just going to make new carpet. It's going for souls in the kingdom. Amen. Can we give God a great big hand of what he's doing and all the great things that he's going to do? The ushers are coming right now as Sister Tara gets ready. She's getting ready to sing. Let me just make a few more announcements. We have a couple announcements, I guess, today. There's just a few things going on at this church. And uh, how many like having a busy schedule and a busy church, amen? And so um, this Wednesday, we will not be doing the Exploring God's Word Bible study. Um, but how many have been enjoying that? How many have been able to come? Hasn't that been awesome? Last Wednesday, this place was almost full. It was just really awesome. And we've had, uh, I'm, I'm not speaking evangelistically here when I say we've had over eight or 900 people watch online. Um, and so that's, that's a pretty amazing reach to say that uh, s- several hundred people have almost 1,000 people. At this point, it might be 1,000 people have watched the live stream on Wednesday night. And so God is doing great big things. And how many know that we're going to see people get the Holy Ghost? How many have been inspired to go teach a Bible study because of that? I know I have. And so it's going to be a great thing. We have just a few announcements. We will still have Bible study on Wednesday night. Pastor will be out of town. That's why we're not going to continue that. But we will still have Bible study at 7 o'clock. And then men's conference is this weekend. So men, if you would like to go to men's conference, all of the information is available on the bulletin board in the hall. And then, of course, next Sunday, we'll have two awesome services. Let's worship right now with Sister Tara as she sings. I had a really hard time picking a song, and I couldn't figure out why. And so I'm sitting over here thinking about our worship songs. And, you know, usually it's between one or two, and God just shows me which one. But this time it was four, so it was a little more difficult. Um, But I finally just, in faith, laid one down there for Brother Kyle, and I'm just sitting there thinking... I was having a conversation with someone about my worship the other day and how they mentioned that I'm always seem to be plugged in. And I said, I don't know how I would have made it throughout without worship. We came to church here in 2004, but 2011 was my year of Job. And if I hadn't had worship, if I hadn't had worshiping the Lord, I'm telling you, I wouldn't be standing here. So I just want to encourage somebody today to listen to the words of this song. Close your eyes and just worship God because no matter what you're going through, if you will bless him and praise him and worship him, you're going to make it. In prisoners' chains with Bleeding stripes, Paul and Silas prayed that night, and in their pain began to sing their chains. Jesus' name, 
we bless your name we bless your name we give you honor give you praise you are the life the truth And that's exactly what we've come to do. Is that right? We come to bless his name. Does anybody want to receive something from the Lord today? Jesus, we invite you in this place right now, Lord. Let your spirit move among this congregation right now, Lord. Lord, we know that you dwell in our praises, Lord. We know that you like to dwell in our worship, God. Lord, let our worship, Lord, be an awesome aroma in this place, Jesus.
worship him right now. Oh, Lord, we want to see your glory. Lord, we worship you. Worship him, worship him with us.
give it all to him right now. Let the worship ball cause this place right now. Lord, we worship you, Lord. We give you all the glory and all the honor, Jesus. We give you all the praise, Lord. Can we give a thunderous hand clap of praise in this place? I feel the Lord in the house. I feel the Lord in the house tonight, today. Praise God. Praise God. He is worthy of all honor and praise. Amen. 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 If you'd like to stand with me, I'm going to um, going to be reading from uh, Romans chapter. 14 and verse number 17, Romans chapter 14 and verse number 17, and um, I want to welcome all of you to this service, so good to see all of you here, God bless you, and those that are joining us on uh, our live stream, we're happy that you are here, God bless you, we pray that the Lord will, has already ministered to you and that he will continue to do so as we preach the word today, amen, we hope you'll come back tonight, start at 6 o'clock. And I have a very special message. I feel like the Lord's laid on my heart for tonight. So if you'll be back here at 5.30 for prayer, 6 o'clock, we'll begin the uh, evening service tonight. Uh, I guess every, every sermon is special. I don't know. I just felt, I just felt a real push for what I want to, the Lord, I feel like the Lord wants me to preach tonight. So Romans chapter 14 and verse number 17. I'm going to read a lot of scripture verses. We're going to post them uh, it's going to be quick so if you have your pen and paper and you want to write these down um, I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be making the case for the kingdom of God this morning that's my sermon title the case for the kingdom so uh, one of my favorite things to do is to go to the fair fairs coming up here pretty soon I, I haven't seen the I haven't seen the schedule yet, but I love to go to the fair because everybody, all the people there are in sale mode. You know, those people with the little things, you know, like I've got on, and they're trying to sell you choppers and whackers and who knows what all they're trying to sell you, all kinds of stuff, carpet cleaners. I love to go through those exhibit booths, and uh, I just love to watch these pitchmen and pitch women. Especially like to go to the, um, I especially like to go to the Vitamix counter. I just sit there and drink everything they make and eat everything they make, and I don't have to go out there and pay a hundred dollars for a corn dog. So uh, it's a lot of fun. I'm going to be in sale mode this morning. I'm going to be trying to sell you on the kingdom of God, unapologetically, without. Without hesitation, I'm going to tell you about the kingdom of God. I'm going to tell you how great it is. I'm actually going to do my best to convince you that if you could make a decision to get in the kingdom of God, it would be the best decision you've ever made in your life. Praise God. Praise God. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. When I come around to this verse again, you'll know I'm just about done with my sermon, so be watching for this verse. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen. This morning, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to attempt to make the case for the kingdom of God, I'm going to show you what the kingdom of God is. I'm going to show you how to get into the kingdom of God. And I'm going to show you the benefits of the kingdom of God if you become a part of his kingdom. That's the three things I want to get across to you this morning with the Lord's help. Let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to our hearts. Heavenly Father, I pray your anointing would come right now. I thank you for what I felt in this service already. And I pray, Lord, that you would let your spirit move through me and in me, Lord, 
speak to me and through me, Lord, as I, as I share this word that you've laid in my heart. God, let somebody, let somebody find you in your kingdom today, Lord, and I'll thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody say amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for standing for the reading of the word of the Lord. The kingdom of God, it's a big topic, and I have to honestly tell you right from the outset, there's no way that we can fully explore this subject in just uh, the next 30 to 40 minutes. But I will hit some highlights of the kingdom of God. The word kingdom, I think we should probably begin by defining what the kingdom of God is. And probably the best way to start that discussion is by defining what the word kingdom means. Um, uh, it's, 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 a Greek, it's a Greek word. The word kingdom is the Greek word basileia, which means it's got several definitions, but let me just share a few of those. Primarily an abstract noun denoting sovereignty. That's a big word. Maybe uh, that means control. That means having the say, having being the boss. If, the per, if a person is sovereign, that means they're in charge. And so, uh, abstractly, the definition of a kingdom is to be sovereign. It's where sovereignty happens. Someone is sovereign. Uh, where it's royal. Uh, it defines power, uh, domination. And so, if you're a part of a kingdom, then the person or the individual or the structure that is uh, uh, in charge of that kingdom is sovereign. That means they have the right to tell you what to, you can do and what you can't do. They have, uh, they have the right to say what, what works and what doesn't work. Uh, they are royalty, if you please. They, uh, they have dominion or they have control. Um, in, uh, in a concrete way, uh, a concrete definition of this noun would denote a territory, a kingdom. It's a territory. You know, the kingdom of uh, whatever, the kingdom of Prussia was a particular land mass, particular area in which this king would rule that would be a part of his kingdom. Uh, not only is it territory, but it's people over whom the king rules. So the king would say, this is my territory and these are my subjects. These are my people. These are the people that I rule over. This is my kingdom. And so... You, you quickly begin to understand when we talk about a kingdom, <clears throat> we talk about a, a sphere or a, 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 an area or a group of people where there is, where God, because it's God's kingdom, the kingdom of God, where God is sovereign, where God rules, where God has dominion, uh, where God says, this is my area and I am, a, I am running and I am ruling this. Now, let me tell you something right off the bat. If you want to be a part of the kingdom of God, you've got to check your ideas and your attitudes at the door. If you want to be a part of the kingdom of God, you can't come into his kingdom and tell him how to run his business. You can't come into his kingdom and say, I don't like that, so I'm not going to do that. You can't do that. You have to live by his rules and by his, by his uh, structure if you're going to be a part of the kingdom of God. It is the sphere where God rules. Now, let me just say this before I go any further. The kingdom of God could, could take on two different, um, two different parts. Maybe that's not a good word, but maybe uh, two different... Uh, I can't think of a better word, so I'll say parts again. Two different parts. The first part of the kingdom of God is, uh, is, is involving uh, the present. The kingdom of God is present. Jesus said the kingdom of God is here with you. And so the kingdom of God is happening now. The only bad part about the kingdom of God that happens now is it has some, it has some, uh, some, some difficult parts to it. The kingdom of God involves sacrifice. The kingdom of God involves uh, 
you know, doing it God's way and not your own way and so on and so forth. And so we can classify and we can define the kingdom of God as what's happening now, the kingdom of God in the earth. But there's another part of the kingdom of God, and that's what's going to happen when it's all over with. And that's when we all get to heaven. And when, when this life as we know it is over, that is the, uh, the, the eternal or the future. That's only going to be glory and, and, and wonderful. All right, if you make it through the present part of the kingdom, I assure you that there's, some, there's a wonderful kingdom of God that awaits us in the second part. Does that make sense to you? And so the kingdom of God is uh, it's now, but it's also future. And so keep that in mind. What I'm preaching about this morning, I'm preaching about the now part. I'm preaching about the kingdom of God in the earth as we know it, being a part of the kingdom of God in the 21st century uh, vernacular in our world, when we talk about the kingdom of God, we would say that the kingdom of God is the, is the kingdom where God is the king. It's kind of a play on words, but it defines it. The kingdom of God is the kingdom where God is the king, where he chooses and he says what works and what doesn't work. He calls the shots. I, my wife told me a story years ago, and I use this a lot when I'm teaching Bible studies and things. She said uh, when in Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, where she was raised, she said uh, there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of uh, kids in her neighborhood, and um, her, the house that she lived in was the only house that had a basement. And so in, in the wintertime, and that usually starts, you know, in, in, in October, you know, it starts getting cold and rainy and you can't play outside anymore. And so the kids in the neighborhood are trying to figure out, you know, what are we going to do? We can't play outside. So where, where are we going to gather to play and whatever we're going to do? And so, so they would always come to her basement and they would always have clubs. And she said, I was always the president of the club <laughs> because it was her house, because it was her basement. And because she was the president of the club, she said who got in and who had to leave. And her subjects would serve her. Uh, I'm making that part of it up. But she told me, she said, I was always the president of the club because the club was in my basement. And nobody else had a basement, and so they had no choice but to come to my basement. In the 21st century understanding of the kingdom of God, I think we immediately begin to understand that it's God's basement. It's his world. He's in control. He says what we can and can't do. He says what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And I just came to remind us one more time, I may say this over and over again during this sermon, but I just want us to realize the day that you want to become a part of the kingdom of God, you have to sign up to follow him. You have to make up your mind. It doesn't matter what I like anymore. It's whatever he likes. It doesn't matter what I think anymore. It's what does he think. The kingdom of God. Amen. I'm making a case this morning for the kingdom of God. It's very important for us to be a part of the kingdom of God. You say, well, Brother Martin, I, you know, I, know, I know you're preaching about the kingdom of God. You know, when, when I go by all of those booths at the fair, they're telling me i got to have this. They're telling me all the reasons why i got to have that. They're telling me that if I get this, you know, uh, uh, my life will be complete. And the truth is I bought a lot of that stuff. I bought a, I bought a peeler one time to peel vegetables. I only used it one time. I bought all kinds. I bought a pillow I bought a, I bought a uh, bamboo pillow, and I ended up giving it to Jalen because it hurt my neck. I paid good money for that, and I heard that her and her dad or her and her mom or somebody was arguing over a bamboo pillow, so I said, I'll settle the argument. You can have this one. And they're going to tell you all the stuff that you're going to have to have. And, and, and I'm not sure that everything they sell you at the fair is going to live up to what they're saying. But I can tell you one thing. You need to be a part of the kingdom of God. 
You need to be a part of the kingdom of God. It is the best decision that you will ever make. The reason I say that is for many reasons. First of all, Mark chapter 1 and verses 14 and 15 tell us uh, that Jesus came preaching. After that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. If Jesus says you need the kingdom of God, if he began his ministry by preaching the kingdom of God, I think it's something you and I ought to be a part of. It's something that's mentioned 69 times in the New Testament. And so it's a very important thing. 69 times the kingdom of God is mentioned by name in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 33 tells us to seek ye first the kingdom of God. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. I'll I'll come back to this verse at at the end of the message this morning. But I'm telling you, Jesus, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said you need to seek after it. Uh, You need to search for it. Uh, You need to become a part of the kingdom of God. Anything that you give up to become a part of the kingdom of God will be worth it. Uh, Anything that you have to struggle with uh, to become a part of the kingdom of God, it will be worth it. Uh, You need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Amen. There's a very smart man in in, 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 uh, the the New Testament. He was a part of the Sanhedrin council. His name was Joseph. Joseph of Arimathea. He was uh, was a part of of the Sanhedrin, which was the 70 ruling members of the Jewish people uh, at the time of Jesus, uh, they 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 trace their their origin all the way back to where Moses uh, uh, chose seventy men that could help him rule the people when they came out of Egypt and they were marching through the wilderness. When his father-in-law Jethro came and said, "You're killing yourself. You gotta you gotta quit this. You gotta get some people to help you." And so he chose seventy leaders to help him make decisions. Uh, and the Sanhedrin council they traced their their origin back to these seventy men. And and uh, these were the seventy most important, uh, uh, most uh, powerful men in all of Judaism at the time of Jesus. Uh, and one of those one of those was Nicodemus. And the other one that we know by name was, uh, uh, was Joseph of Arimathea. And I want you to see what the Bible says about Joseph of Arimathea. He, uh, in, in Mark chapter 15 and verse number 43, uh, it says, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God. He understood enough from the Old Testament about the kingdom of God, and he was looking for it. He was waiting for it. Uh, he didn't understand everything about it, but he was waiting for the kingdom of God. That shows you the value of the kingdom of God. It shows you how important the kingdom of God is. If that doesn't convince you of how important it is to be a part of the kingdom of God, listen to what Jesus said in Mark chapter 9 and verse number 47. Those with squeamish stomachs just kind of uh, shut your eyes and plug your ears. Uh, He said, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. Uh, It would be better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast uh, into hellfire. That's how valuable and how important the kingdom of God is. If you had a choice of having two eyes and being lost or having one eye plucking out one of your own eyes and being a part of the kingdom of God, Jesus said that you'd be better off to pluck out one of your own eyes. Sounds pretty important, doesn't it? Sounds pretty valuable. The kingdom of God. Be better to enter into life with one eye than having two eyes to be lost. Let me tell you something else about the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 4, or I'm sorry, Mark chapter 4, verses 11 and 12 tells us that people do not understand the kingdom of God. People outside of a, a spiritual revelation do not understand the kingdom of God. Jesus said unto them, I, I preached about this the other day, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to them which are without 
All these things are done in parables that seeing they may see and not perceive and hearing they may hear and not understand lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. Jesus said, all that simply means is Jesus said, I I teach in parables, in stories, so that people that don't understand will just think it's a good story. But the people that really want to understand can get the message behind the story and understand the real, the real message that I'm preaching. I just came to tell you, uh, when you make a decision to become a part of the kingdom of God, you remember one thing. Uh, there are people that will not understand you. They will say, you didn't have to do that. They'll say, that wasn't that important. Why did you do that? They'll look at you and they'll say, uh, you've lost your mind. I can't believe that. I can't believe that you want to be a part of that church. People do not understand the ramifications of the kingdom of God until they become a part of it. Until they become a part of it. Uh, That's when it all seems to begin to make sense. Amen. It's just like the Old Testament tabernacle. If you study the Old Testament tabernacle... If you looked at it from the outside, it was, uh, you, 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 you know what I'm talking about when I say the tabernacle? That's the, that's the church that was in the wilderness that they folded up and carried on their shoulders. And every time they'd stop, they'd set it up. That was their church. It was the tabernacle. That tabernacle, it was covered with brown badger skin. On the outside of that, 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 that tabernacle, it looked ugly. It looked drab. It looked terrible. But when you stepped inside of that tabernacle, it was beautiful. When you stepped inside, it was gold. There was gold and there was silver and there was fine twine linen and and there were scarlet tapestries and and it was absolutely beautiful. It reminds me, Matthew, uh, when we we were evangelizing years ago... Uh, we were went and preached at a church, a particular church. I even remember the church. And uh, it didn't look very nice on the outside, but when you walked in, it looked nicer on the inside. And Matthew was just a little bitty. And did he tell us or did he tell the pastor? He told us, thankfully. He didn't tell the pastor. He said, this reminds me of the tabernacle. It's ugly on the outside, but it's beautiful on the inside. People didn't understand the beauty of the tabernacle because when you look at it on the outside, it was drab. It was just brown. It was, uh, it was very unattractive. Uh, but when you stepped inside of the, of the tabernacle, it was beautiful. Uh, it, was, uh, it was shiny. It was sparkly. Uh, it was full of color. It was absolutely amazing, not to mention the fact uh, that the presence of God dwelt in the holy of holies. Uh, I came to remind somebody, uh, if you decide to be a part of the kingdom of God, don't expect everybody around around you to understand what you're doing. Don't expect everybody around you to say, oh, that's a great idea. I'm glad for you. I'm happy. Some will. But some are going to probably say, what in the world did you do that for? You were just fine the way you were. But what you have to let them understand and what you have to remember is, I want to get into the presence of God. I want to get into the kingdom of God. I see the beauty of the kingdom of God. Praise God. Amen. The kingdom of God is a mystery to the world. They don't understand life in the kingdom of God. They think of it as restriction, but we think of it as liberty. I'm set free. I'm free. I'm not bound by sin anymore. I'm not bound by my habits anymore. I've been set free by the kingdom of God. I've stepped into the Holy Spirit of God, and he's changed my life forever. I don't expect everybody to understand that. I don't expect people out there to understand that, but I know one thing. When I stepped foot in the kingdom of God, it was the best decision I ever made in my life. (laughs) Praise God. Amen. They think of it as sorrow and sadness, but we see it as joy. We see it as happiness. We see it as relief. We see it as the blessing, the greatest blessing that we've ever received. Amen. The kingdom of God, I'm trying to help you understand the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the newest version. It's the most updated version. 
Everybody wants the newest iPhone. Everybody wants the newest Android. Everybody wants the newest computer. Everybody wants the newest car. Everybody wants the newest whatever. Everybody wants the newest, the biggest, the best. Uh, and don't, don't look at me like that. You know, I'm telling you the truth. Everybody wants that. But I'm telling you, the kingdom of God is the most updated thing going in this world. It is the most updated thing happening in this world. Luke chapter 7 and verse number 28 what Jesus is talking about here, he's talking about John the Baptist. Remember John the Baptist? John the Baptist, I mean, he was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And listen to what he said. Jesus said, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater than John the Baptist. Jesus said, among those that are in the natural world, among those that are born of women, the, there is none greater than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. He's greater than John. It doesn't matter. You may say, I can't play the piano. I can't sing. I can't preach. I can't testify. I can't do anything. I can't, I can't hardly even pay attention. Uh, I'm so poor, I can't hardly even pay attention. Uh, I can't do anything. Uh, I'm nobody. Uh, if you have the gift of the Holy Ghost, if you walked into the kingdom of God, uh, you are greater uh, than the greatest thing outside uh, of the kingdom of God. He that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was the one that came to show us Jesus Christ. You want to be on the cutting edge. You want to have the greatest thing going. You want to have the newest and the most updated option of everything happening. Get in the kingdom of God. It is the greatest thing that you could ever do. <laughs> Praise God. Now the question is, this leads me to the question, how... Do you get into the kingdom of God? How do you get into the kingdom of God? Mark chapter 10 and verse number 14. When Jesus saw the disciples trying to push the children away and said, they said, He's got, he doesn't have time for you. Get away. He's got bigger fish to fry. He's got bigger things to do. Leave him alone. When Jesus saw it, he was much displeased, and he said unto his disciples, Suffer the little children to come to me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. So the first thing I would tell you about getting into the kingdom of God, the first thing you've got to understand about how to get into the kingdom of God, you've got to become like a child. What does that mean? You've got to become like a child. I, I don't know everything that that means, uh, but let me give you a few hints and a few ideas. Uh, children are, 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 are full of faith. They just have faith. They don't have enough uh, knowledge to understand uh, uh, how everything works. They just have faith. Reminds me of something my grandson told his teacher this week. He's in pre-K. He told her, Augie told his pre-K teacher, he said, I'm going to make a few adjustments to the playground. <laughs> she said, you are? He said, yes. She said, what are you going to do? I'm, I, I, I'm trying to get it right. You help me if I get it wrong. He said something like, I'm going to find a machine, and, and I'm going to, a rock-sucking machine, and I'm going to suck up all the rocks off the playground. And then I'm going to get another machine, and I'm going to put down some squishy material. Literally. I'm going to fill the playground with squishy material. She said, that's great. He said, I'm going to do it at night, so I'm going to bring my flashlight. <laughs> this kid is a genius. He takes after his grandpa. <laughs> he doesn't understand. I mean, there are machines that pick up rocks, but man, it would be a big deal to get one of those machines. There are machines that put squishy material out there, but he doesn't understand. You know, that's all EPA regulated, and you're going to have to figure all that out, and you're going to have to get the right material there, and you're going to have to put a base down, and you're going to have to, you know, he just doesn't understand all of that. He just has faith. Uh, he just believes, I'm going to get a machine, uh, and I'm going to suck up all those hard rocks. I'm going to blow out some squishy material, uh, and I'm going to get this thing changed. I'm going to make some adjustments uh, on this playground so the next time I fall down, I don't skin up my elbow. Uh, you see, a kid has faith. Uh, a kid 
it understands and thinks, uh, I can do anything I want to do. Uh, I'm telling somebody here, you want to be a part of the kingdom of God, uh, you got to learn to have faith in God. Uh, you got to forget about all your own ideas. Uh, you got to forget about how to do it your way. Uh, and you got to do it God's way. You got to be like a child. Let me tell you something else about kids. Kids, uh, kids forgive. They can be fighting one minute and they can be hugging each other the next second. They don't hold grudges. That's the way kids are. That's not the way adults are. We get a grudge and we hold it and we, we rock it and, and we stick it in our pocket and we, uh, we do everything we can. We get it out every now and then and make sure it's still there uh, because we get mad at people and we get all upset. We get our feelings hurt. Uh, we get all uh, offended uh, and all of that. Uh, Jesus said if you want to be a part of the kingdom of God, you got to be like a child. Uh, you got to be forgiving. Uh, you got to get forgiveness. You got to give forgiveness. Uh, that's the only way you can become a part of the kingdom of God. Come on, somebody. Uh, it's not worth it. Uh, don't hold that grudge against anybody. Uh, it's not worth it. Uh, if, they, if, if they're keeping you from God, they're closer to God than you are. That'll preach. You've got to become like a child. Children are uninhibited. We come up here to pray in the altar and we're like this. Or I'm going to stay at my pew. Because I don't want anybody looking at me. I don't want anybody, I don't want anybody uh, thinking anything about me. Kids don't care. They're running around. They're disrupting everything. They don't care. They don't have a clue. Doesn't make a difference to them. All they know is they're just doing what they feel like doing. You want to become a part of the kingdom of God? You're going to have to become uninhibited. You may have to get beyond this. You may have to get to this. You may have to get beyond this. You may have to get to this. You may have to get beyond this. You may have to get to this. I don't know. But you got to make up your mind. It doesn't matter what it costs me to get there. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks about me or what anybody says about me. I've made up my mind. I'm going to be a part of the kingdom of God. And you've got to become like a child if you're going to be part of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The next thing that has to happen is you have to be born again. This is not my words. This is Jesus' words. This is what Jesus said in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. I'll just, just buzz through it really quick. Uh, he was a man of the Pharisees, Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. Remember I told you he was a part of the, uh, he was a part of the Sanhedrin. Uh, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, uh, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I could, make, could have made this point earlier. You'll never understand or see it till you become a part of it. It'll all make sense to you after you're in it. It'll all become clear to you after you become a part of it. And Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot see, comprehend, understand the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is confused now. He says, what do you mean? i got to be born? Can I enter the second time into my mother's womb and be born? Uh, Jesus answered and said unto him, verily, verily, I say unto thee, um, except a man be born of water uh, and of the Spirit, capital S, that's the Holy Spirit, uh, except a man be born of water, that's baptism, uh, and the Spirit, that's the infilling of the Holy Spirit, uh, he cannot enter into uh, the kingdom of God. Uh, I can hear somebody saying right now, I just don't believe uh, that you got to receive the Holy Ghost to be a part of the kingdom of God. May I remind you it's not your kingdom. May I remind you you don't set the rules for the kingdom. May I remind us it's his kingdom. And he said if you want to be a part of it, you have to be born again from above of water and spirit. That's how you get into the kingdom. It's not our kingdom. It's not, it's not what we say. It's his kingdom. Water and spirit. It's exactly what Simon Peter said in Acts 2.38. I didn't put this on, didn't give them this verse. But Acts 2.38 says, Peter said, repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That's water. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's spirit. The promise is to you, to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call everybody. So how do you get into the kingdom? How do you become a part of the kingdom? You first of all have to be like a child. I know this seems like a long sermon. I've only been preaching 28 minutes, okay? Everybody still okay? 
<laughs> it's funny to watch that happen because people are clapping and there's other people going like. <laughs> Don't you love when the preacher says, just, he's already been preaching an hour and a half. Just give me five more minutes and the person next to you is going, yeah. And you're like. Not quite that bad. <laughs> you got to get in. You got to become a, like a child. You've got to be born again of the water and of the spirit. It's costly. It's costly to enter the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 24. Again, I say unto you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. I was going to read it all the way down through verse 30, but I knew I was going to be pushing time, so I just scratched that out. But if I were to go down through verse 30, you would find that in verse 26, Jesus said, this is only possible with God, not with man. With man, this is impossible, but not with God, for with God, all things are possible. He goes on in verses 27 through 29, and he says, uh, it's going to be worth it. Don't worry about it. Whatever it costs you, it's going to be worth it. Uh, uh, Paul, uh, uh, Peter said, we've left all and have followed thee. And we've left houses and brothers and mothers and fathers and sisters and lands and houses. And uh, we've left everything to follow you. And Jesus said... Uh, that's great. Uh, you made a great investment uh, because you're going to receive now in this time a hundred times more and in the world to come eternal life. Remember, that's the two parts uh, of the kingdom of God. Right now, it's going to be a hundred times better and in the world to come eternal life. It's going to be wonderful for all of eternity. Uh, it, I'm not saying it's not costly to become a part of the kingdom of God. It's difficult. It's challenging. Uh, it's, it, it's like putting a camel through the eye of a knee. Uh, Matthew, th this is recorded in the, in the gospel of Matthew and in the gospel of Luke. Uh, Matthew uses the word needle for a sewing needle. Luke is a physician, so, so Luke uses the word for a uh, surgical needle. I've had people, I've heard people preach it. I've even preached it before, you know. It's like, uh, you know, a, a door in the gate and the, the camel would have to take off everything. They'd take everything off the camel. The camel would have to get down on his hands and knees and, 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 and kind of inch its way through that gate. Uh, uh, they, they call it the eye of the needle. Uh, no, he was talking about a real uh, uh, sewing needle or a surgical needle. Uh, in other words, he was saying that it's impossible uh, for you to save yourself. Uh, it's impossible for you to get in the kingdom of God on your own, but nothing is impossible with God. The day you repent of your sins, the day you are baptized in his name, the day he puts his Holy Spirit inside of you, he will put you into his kingdom. It's impossible for you, but not with God, because with God, all things are possible. But I, I just must tell you, to get into the kingdom, there must be there must be some sacrifice. You can't get in the kingdom and just do what you want to do. You can't get in the kingdom and just live any way you want to live. You can't get in the kingdom and just dress any way you want to dress. I, I wouldn't be your friend if I didn't tell you this. When you get in the kingdom of God, suddenly you lose all of your what you want. And now it's what do you want? Because I want to be a part of your kingdom. Praise God. It's costly to enter the kingdom of God. Let me tell you something else about the kingdom of God. It's a struggle. It's a struggle to get into the kingdom of God. Some people receive the Holy Ghost really e easily, and some people press their way into it. But people who come, I, I'm convinced, I could be wrong, but I'm convinced people who come to the altar and receive the Holy Ghost really easy, they probably did a lot of pressing before they got there. Because the humanity part of us does not want to surrender and submit. Have you ever watched somebody, please, I hope this doesn't offend anybody, but have you ever watched somebody trying to die? I stood by my mom's bed as she was dying. And everything, her kidneys had, she had renal uh, failure, her kidneys had shut down, everything was, I mean, everything was going south really fast, and she was trying to die. But there was something in her body that was trying to live. And, and she was struggling for every breath. And I was begging the Lord, just take her. Just, you know, I mean, 
when it got to the point where we knew that this is not going to change, this is not going to get better, Lord, just take her. And, and, and she'd breathe, and then she'd stop breathing for about, it seemed like an hour, but it would just be a, just maybe a, a couple of minutes. And then she'd take another breath. And, and this went on for hours and hours and hours. And if you've been around a, a loved one who, who passed away, you watch this happen. You know why? Because there's something innate in the human body that wants to live, that wants to, to, to survive and wants to have control and wants to, wants to live. And I came to tell you that the day that you are born in the kingdom of God is the day you have to die. You have to die to yourself. You have to die to your flesh. You have to die to your natural desires. And everything inside of you wants to live. Everything inside of you wants to get an excuse as to why you shouldn't repent and why this isn't important and why this is not necessary. But I'm telling you the day that you never at that altar uh, and the day that you surrendered everything you had to the Lord Jesus Christ uh, the day that you said not my will but thy will be done uh, the day that you died that's what repentance is uh, repentance is absolute and complete death uh, it's dying out to yourself uh, and it's turning around and going the other direction uh, the day that you died is the day that you came to life uh, because when you died the spirit of God came into you uh, and gave you life uh, and you were born again of the water and of the spirit <laughs> hallelujah it takes a struggle to get into the kingdom of God you must press your way into it Luke chapter 16 and verse number 16 the law and the prophets were until John but since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it he pushes he presses he struggles he forces his way into the kingdom of god all i can tell you is it's going to be worth it all i can tell you when you get in the kingdom of god it's going to be worth every long mile it's going to be worth every struggle it's going to be worth everything that you ever gave up because he's going to give you a hundred times more in this world and then in the world to come, eternal life. Did anybody see that picture that was going around on, I don't know if it's Instagram, I saw it on Twitter. It's called First Day in Heaven. Anybody see that picture? I wish I would have thought about this before now. All it was was just a painting of a lady with her arms around Jesus. You couldn't see his face, you couldn't see her face, all you could see she had her head buried in his neck. You could see the little rainbow around his head. And it's like, when I saw it, I told my wife, I said, when I saw that, I just about busted out crying. She said, when I saw it, I did bust out crying. Heaven's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. Whatever struggle, whatever Whatever pressing has to happen to get into the kingdom of God, it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. Acts chapter 14 and verse number 22 says, we enter into the kingdom through much tribulation into the kingdom of God. That word tribulation means pressure. I'm not talking about the tribulation at the end, like great tribulation. I'm not talking about that. Talk about pressure. We enter into the kingdom of God through much pressure, struggle, pressing. I heard this one time. I don't know if it's true or not, but I heard someone say this. I'll repeat it. Don't take it as fact. If anybody can find this somewhere and bring it to me, I would love that. It's either this verse or another verse that says, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. I think maybe it's that verse. He said the, the idea here was the priest in the Old Testament. One time a year on the Day of Atonement, the priest would go into the Holy of Holies. You're familiar with that, maybe? Inside the tabernacle, the holy place, altar of incense, table of showbread, golden candlestick. The priest could go in there every day and keep the oil in the lamp and keep change the bread out keep the incense burning but one time a year 
one man, the high priest, would come to the brazen altar and would slay an animal. He would collect the blood in a basin. He would go into the holy place. And then he would make his way behind the veil into the holy of holies. Inside the holy of holies was the Ark of the Covenant. That was the presence, that's where the presence of the Lord dwelt. Right between the two cherubims, the wings with the, of the angels that were made out of gold that sat on top of the, the box, the ark. The presence of the Lord dwelt between those two cherubims. The veil that separated the holy place and the holy of holies was very thick. So thick that it says that two oxen tied and one on each end couldn't tear it apart. It was so thick and so tightly woven. So we've got the priest now. The high priest, he's got a basin of blood in his hand with some hyssop, some branches, some like hyssop branches, because that's what they would use, dip it in the blood and they would sprinkle it. So he's got the basin of blood in his hand. And now he's trying to get into the holy of holies, into the presence of the Lord. If you could use this, if I could use this as an illustration, into the kingdom of God, where the presence of the Lord is. He's got his hands full. Step up here. You guys become the veil. All right, let's start this thing. You're the post. He's got his hands full and he's trying to get into the, that's the Ark of the Covenant in there. So here's the post that's holding up this big, thick veil. So how's he going to get in there? He doesn't have any hands. He's holding the basin. So what he does... pressing his way into the holy of holies maybe uses a shoulder maybe he sticks an elbow in there I don't know but he's working his way into the holy of holies where he now stands in the presence of the Lord and he can begin to sprinkle that blood at the foot of the ark of the covenant I just want to tell you something that's, that's a picture of getting in the kingdom of God That's a picture of getting into the kingdom of God. Every man presses his way into it. You're going to get through it, but you're going to press your way into the kingdom of God. You want to be a part of the kingdom of God? It's not going to be a walk in the park. There's going to be pressure. Mark chapter 12 and verse number 34. Can I just remind somebody? You can be close, but not in it. You can be close to the kingdom of God, but not in it. Well, I love to come to church, and I love to be there, and I love to sing the songs, and I love to feel the presence of the Lord, and I love all of that. I love it. That's my church. It's where I go. You can be close. Jesus said to this man, he said, what must I do to get in the kingdom of God? He said, you got to keep the commandments. He said, I've kept the commandments my whole life. From the time I was a child, I kept like, the commandments. What lack I yet? Jesus said, you are not far. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. You can be close, but not in it. You can be close, but not in it. I'm telling somebody here today, best decision you ever make in your life is to press your way into the kingdom of God become a part of the kingdom of God whatever it costs and whatever it takes and here's why I say it I'm going to finish with this here's why I say it because when you become a part of the kingdom of God remember this verse seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you what are we going to eat what are we going to drink what we're going to wear all of these things of life he's going to take care of that So you become a part of the kingdom of God. I'm not saying you can just sit home and, you know, eat bonbons. You're going to have to work. You're going to have to go through your life and do what, but God's going to take care of you. If you do your part, he's going to do his part. When you become a part of the kingdom of God, he's going to add everything to you. He's going to make sure you're taken care of. And now I come to my final text, my, my opening text, which is my final verse. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. The whole context of this passage, and I don't have time to go into it except to tell you, 
the context of this passage, of this verse, is they were talking about, Paul was talking about eating meat offered to idols and uh, how they, some people believe that you could eat, they would offer, an, uh, offer you know, uh, some meat to an idol and burn it up. You could go to a restaurant, you could buy it cheap and you could eat it because it had been offered and sacrificed unto idols. And some people b- did it because they an idol didn't mean anything to them and some people were idol worshipers before they came to the Lord and it really offended them and so that was the big issue in those days do we can we eat the meat that's offered and sacrificed to idols or not and some people said Paul said as far as I'm concerned it doesn't mean anything it's just a good t-bone steak for cheap and I'm gonna eat it because I don't believe in idols and it doesn't mean anything to me Somebody else said, well, you know, I used to do that every day, and it just really bothers me because, and I can't do that. That's my personal conviction. I can't do that. And so Paul said, well, okay, if it bothers you, then I won't do it in front of you. I won't, because I don't want to offend you. Uh, I will eat no meat while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. That's in Corinthians. So, so Paul is talking now in the latter part of the book of Romans, and he's, he's talking about uh, Christian living and things that we should and shouldn't do. And he gets on the subject of eating meat offered and sacrificed to idols and the liberty of that. And here's what he says. Romans chapter 14 and verse number... Verse 16. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. After all, another translation says, after all, the kingdom of God is not a matter of getting the food and drink one likes, but it is intended to us to be righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. He said, after all, the benefit of the kingdom of God is not to serve us with our natural desires. The kingdom of God, the purpose of the kingdom of God is not for you to walk away and say, I can do anything I want and I'm happy and everything's wonderful and and I'm fulfilled because I can just eat what I want, I can do what I want. No. He said the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it is first of all righteousness. What is righteousness? We're all sinners. We're all bad. We've all done wrong things. There's only one righteous and that's God. And when you get into the kingdom of God, he covers you with his righteousness. When you become a part of the kingdom of God and you repent of your sins, he says, okay, I forgive you and I will now make you righteous. The definition of righteousness is just being right. I'll make you right. I'll I'll, 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 I'll fix you. You won't be wrong anymore. You won't be a sinner anymore. I'll put my righteousness on you. This is why you need to be part of the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is righteousness. It's his righteousness in my life. The kingdom of God is peace. The kingdom of God is peace. Could I tell you that word peace means calm, tranquility, harmony, security. It is... Uh, It is the opposite of rage uh, and the opposite of havoc. Uh, Are you tired of your life going off the rails? Uh, Are you tired of everything going wrong in your life? Uh, Are you tired of trying to find something to escape uh, all of the havoc and all the trials and all the trouble uh, and all of the anxieties of life? Uh, Get in the kingdom of God because in the kingdom of God you have peace. In the kingdom of God, you have tranquility. Uh, There is calmness. There is harmony. Uh, There is security. Uh, There is everything that you need in the kingdom of God. There's righteousness. There is peace. And there is joy. That word joy actually is translated as gladness. uh, As gladness. Uh, It's the opposite of sorrow. Uh, It's it's gladness. Uh, I know some people are saying right now, if I could just be happy, uh, if I could just be satisfied, uh, if I could just get beyond all of these struggles and all of these troubles, um, if I could somehow just get beyond all of this anxiety uh, and all of these things that are happening in my life, uh, if I could just get beyond it, I'd be so happy. I got a good news for you. Uh, You can get in the kingdom of God. Uh, You can get in the kingdom of God and he will change your life forever. Uh, You've got to be born again of the water and spirit uh, that starts out with repentance. It starts out with surrender. It starts out with just saying, Lord, I'm, I don't want my kingdom anymore. I want your kingdom. I want you 
to rule and reign in my life. Praise God. Stand with me if you would right now. I'm going to open this altar. And when I open this altar this morning, I hope I've pitched it good enough. I've tried my best. I've tried my best to pitch it to you the best of my ability. I've tried to help you understand what the kingdom of God is. How to get into the kingdom of God and what the benefits are once you're there. And I'm telling somebody, if you want to become a part of the kingdom of God, where there's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, uh, you can make your way to this altar. Maybe there's somebody here, you've already got the Holy Spirit inside of you, but you want to come and just thank Him for the righteousness and the peace and the joy that He's given you. I'm opening this altar as they begin to sing right now. As they sing, this altar is open. You can come right now and you can receive the kingdom of God and be a part of the kingdom of God right now. Sing now. Uh, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, I pray your anointing. God, I pray your anointing to come right now. Help us to press into it, Lord. Help us to press into your kingdom, Lord. Not my will, but thy will be done. Not my will, but thy will be done. Hallelujah.
Thank you for those you've touched online, oh God. I give you thanks for it. I give you praise, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you for being here this morning, and I pray that you receive something from the Lord. Go home and study out the kingdom of God. Get your Bible out. Just study it. There's plenty more there for you to learn. Amen. Come back tonight. Prayer room is open at 530, 6 o'clock. We'll begin our service. God bless you. Encourage.